Hi, my name is Kadax, and welcome to my Shadowlands Fury Warrior Guide. Now, unlike most of the guides that I've seen on YouTube, I'm not about to copy all of the content from Archimitros. Archimitros? Archimitros. Yeah, that. He's the guy who writes the Fury Warrior Guides on Wowhead and Icy Veins. If you're looking for the basics of how to play Fury this expansion, honestly, I would say just go read his guides on Wowhead or Icy Veins, or wherever else he has them posted. However, there's a number of details about playing Fury that are either omitted or simply glossed over in the aforementioned guides that I think warrant some attention, and this guide will be focusing on covering some of the more technical aspects and nuances that I believe matter when you wish to excel at playing the spec. That said, it would be remiss of me not to overview some of the normal things like spec, covenants, stat weights, and etc. So let's go through that now. Starting with Covenants, making the best meaningful choice TM mostly depends on your primary gameplay focus. For raiding, Venthyr is the go-to. If you care more about Mythic Plus, then Kyrian is your go-to. Night Fae is generally the second best option for either of those scenarios, and is actually slightly more damaged than Kyrian in Mythic Plus, but Kyrian beats out Night Fae for higher keys due to the ability to remove a lot of debuff types. If you like doing less damage while making other people do more damage, so they look like they're even better than you, then feel free to go Necrolord. And if your primary focus is PvP, what are you doing here? Go find an arms guide. If you're going Venthyr, in most cases, the best option is to use Nadja as your soulbind and then take the path of getting Agent of Chaos and then Dauntless Duelist. And then in your potency condiment, you should use Ashen Juggernaut to give your Condemn a stacking crit buff. However, in scenarios where you're going to be spending an extended period of time not damaging your initial target, and also in fights that involve at least four target AoE for the majority of the encounter, gaining a, a second potency conduit by going for familiar predicaments will be more beneficial than getting Dauntless Duelist. In these cases, the best potency conduits for you to get are either going to be Depths of Insanity for the increased recklessness duration for the single target scenario, or Harrowing Punishment for the AoE scenario. If you're going Kyrian, then currently the best option appears to be using Pelagos as your soulbind, and then taking the path of going for Focusing Mantra and Cleansed Vestments. In your Potency Conduits, you should be using Depths of Insanity to increase the duration of Recklessness, and Piercing Verdict to increase the damage and rage generation of your Spear of Bastion. If you're going Night Fate, currently the best option appears to be using Corain as your soulbind, and taking the path of getting Horn of the Wild Hunt, Get Information, and First Strike. In your Potency Conduit, currently Destructive Reverberations appears to be the best choice in most contexts, though that could be subject to change. If you played Fury in BFA, then the default build should not be all that surprising. You grab Sudden Death. If you're going Venthyr, then grab Massacre, otherwise you're going to grab Frenzy. Then you grab Cruelty, grab Dragon's Roar, and Siegebreaker. Though, there are a few things that I would like to note. The reason for taking Cruelty is due to the current value of Mastery and our stat priorities. Cruelty leverages the properties of exponential growth to greatly benefit Raging Blow. Basically, all damage modifiers interact multiplicatively, so increasing the number of damage modifiers being multiplied together results in each modifier being functionally worth more than its face value. Next, depending on the context, taking Bladestorm over Dragon's Roar for AoE situations is much more viable this expansion due to one of the legendary options that I'll be discussing a little bit later. Finally, currently Anger Management and Reckless Abandon are simming very close to Siegebreaker. Siegebreaker still wins out, but I suspect that there is a, an Anger Management build and a gear set for it that beats out Siegebreaker. I haven't found it yet, but I do believe that there's probably one out there. For your stat priority, after weapon damage, Strength is our new best friend, being worth roughly double that of our best secondary stat. And as far as secondary stats are concerned, Haste is King, followed by Mastery, then versatility and crit are just slightly behind mastery and are roughly equivalent to each other. For legendaries, at least right now at this point in time in the expansion, our best choice is Deathmaker and to put it on our legs with haste and mastery. The reason for Deathmaker on legs rather than on cloak is because the stat budget for leg armor is greater than the stat budget for cloaks. This means that you gain a bit more stats by putting them on your legs rather than having it on your cloak. You get this legendary from the second boss in Necrotic Wake. And with the changes that were made recently to the drop rate, I hope that it doesn't take you 73 runs to get this like it did for me. Once the Castle Nathia raid unlocks, the best option for Mythic Plus is to get the Signet of Tormented Kings, which drops off the Stone Legion Generals. If you're going to use this legendary, it greatly incentivizes taking Bladestorm 
to maximize the benefit of the legendary effect. With that out of the way, let's start talking about some of the more interesting stuff, at least in my opinion. Now, it should be noted that some of what I'm about to discuss are heuristics specifically built around the theoretical model that I used to play World of Warcraft called Batch Ability Forecasting. If you would like to know more about Batch Ability Forecasting, click on the card in the upper right to see the videos that I made on the subject. Our opening rotation really hasn't changed since BFA, but given that Recklessness is now off the global cooldown, it might feel slightly different. You should cast Recklessness, then immediately charge, and then use Shield Breaker. Because Siege Breaker is the only ability of these three that is on the global cooldown, you can easily create a macro to do this if you aren't a big fan of hitting three buttons almost simultaneously. After you've done this, you should have a pair of melee swings that occur immediately. This will put you at 78 rage. 40 from the charge, 20 from Siege Breaker, 12 from your main hand, and 6 from your offhand. At this point, I would use Bloodthirst since you're not enraged. This will put you at 94 rage, and then you should have plenty of time to hit Rampage before your next melee swings rage cap you. From there, you can alternate between Raging Blow and Condemn, filling with Bloodthirst as needed if you're Venthyr. Otherwise, go about your normal rotation if you're one of the other Covenants. Now, this is a fairly obvious one, but I think it's important to reiterate, and that's the fact that Spell Reflect is off the global cooldown and also costs no rage, so there's literally no reason not to use it when you know that there's going to be incoming spell damage. When using the Deathmaker legendary effect, each instance of Rampage has its own chance to proc Deathmaker. This means that each enemy hit by a cleaved Rampage from Whirlwind has a chance to proc Siege Breaker. This benefits Venthyr players slightly, as they don't run Frenzy, and therefore they should be target swapping to any targets that got the Deathmaker proc in order to maximize their damage. If you are running Frenzy, don't do this, because the increased damage that you would gain by doing the target swap isn't worth losing your Frenzy stacks. There is currently also a gameplay impacting issue with how Deathmaker procs interact with casting Siegebreaker. Now, anyone who used Vision of Perfection in Battle for Azeroth is likely familiar with this issue, as it's the exact same problem. And that problem is this. The way that Deathmaker is coded, when it procs, it basically says, add 6 seconds to the Siegebreaker debuff. And if there is no Siegebreaker debuff active, then it creates the debuff. Now, the way that Siegebreaker itself is coded is that when you cast it, the game basically says, create an instance of the Siegebreaker debuff with 10 seconds on it. Now, that difference is important because this means that if you cast Siegebreaker and then use Rampage and get a Deathmaker proc from that, then the duration of the Siegebreaker debuff is going to be about 16 seconds, based on GCDs and whatnot. However, if you use Rampage and get a Deathmaker proc and then cast Siegebreaker right after, your Siegebreaker will have a duration of only 10 seconds. This causes you to effectively waste your Deathmaker proc because Siegebreaker overwrites the duration value rather than adding to it. Ultimately, this means that it is important to delay using Siegebreaker if there is a Deathmaker proc active, and this is to maximize the Siegebreaker debuff uptime. Because we don't have Cold Steel Hot Blood anymore, our priorities for deciding whether or not to use Raging Blow versus Bloodthirst have changed in Shadowlands. By default, Raging Blow does more damage and generates more rage than Bloodthirst, however, Bloodthirst does have a 30% chance to trigger in rage. Cruelty makes it such that it's much preferred to use Raging Blows during Enraged due to the increased damage and cooldown reset chance. Therefore, here are the decision-making heuristics that I use, though it should be noted that these heuristics are assuming a context of being able to choose between Raging Blow or Bloodthirst. In other words, both of them are off cooldown. Formally, this is what it looks like. If you're Enraged, obviously, choose Raging Blow. And if you're not Enraged, it depends on whether or not you have both charges available on Raging Blow or the second charge will complete its cooldown within one global cooldown. In that case, you want to use Raging Blow to keep that cooldown rolling. If not, then I'm going to use Bloodthirst to try to fish for an Enrage proc, and then hopefully use that Raging Blow that I'm holding on to during that Enrage time. More simply, the only time to use Bloodthirst over a Raging Blow is if you're not Enraged, and Raging Blow still has a cooldown ticking that has greater than one global cooldown remaining on it. Now, I'm still in the process of trying to mathematically model this, so while my hypothesis is that what I'm about to share with you is a DPS increase, I don't actually have any real evidence to support that yet, so just keep that in mind. In scenarios where you would normally want to fill with Whirlwind, it might actually be best to intervene a friendly unit and then immediately charge back to your target for the 20 rage that charge gives. Doing this messes with your swing timers, though, so the, that loss of damage combined with obviously you're losing raged 
generated from delaying those hits. It might not make it worth it, though on the bright side, at the very least, it's going to make you look cool. Thank you for watching this guide. As new theory crafting occurs for how best to play a Fury Warrior, and also as patches change the balancing for Fury Warriors, I'm going to be making update videos to make sure that there's all the complete and current information available. So feel free to subscribe to my channel if you're interested in seeing that future content. Regardless of that though, I have a request to make of you that I make on every single video, which is tell me why I'm wrong in the comments. Tell me why the information that I'm presenting is stupid, it doesn't work, it's not actually that way. Tell me what is the right way.